And I'm just going to do an intro. Here we are with Paul Spinetti. Hi. I mean, Paolo, <laughs> sorry, Paolo. Yeah, that's Paolo, right. Paolo, Paolo Spinetti. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good day. Where are they? Whatever time you're, you're watching this. That's right. So the alignment problem. Mm-hmm. AI Fine. aligned with humanity. You know, every time we've stuffed around with things, we've created an alignment issue and we, we just don't solve it. We just don't solve the alignment because it gets too ingrained. Example? We introduced sugar in the 18th century. <laughs> That's a good one. Yep. People were like, oh, sugar. Oh, it tastes beautiful. Mm, yum, yum, yum. Yum, yum, process that. <laughs> well, one then, spoon, two should be even better. And people would start to just put sugar in their mouth and let it sit there and go to sleep. Mm. Just And then when their teeth started to decay and rot, they would put more sugar. And you apparently see this huge shift in, uh, in France, they have this thing underneath the city with all the dead, like, I don't catacombs? know. Catacombs? Catacombs or something. And they would notice that from <laughs> that century onwards, the amount of horrific tooth destruction in the dental records of those particular mm, mm, uh, skeletons, or whatever you call it, it was horrific. And that's because we introduced something that wasn't a problem. Um, Until we made it a problem. In our uh, ancestral environment, let's say. We introduced something that was not, you know, our taste buds were perfectly attuned to our ancestral environment and it was in balance. We introduced something that created an imbalance and it was because profits, people mm. wanted to make money, people wanted to like, oh, let's let's make sweets. People want to buy sweets, let's, let's do that. And just kept going and going and going. And then how do we correct it? Oh, dentists, let's start brushing our teeth. Fluoride, you put the sugar in, make it to decay, get the fluoride to scrub the sugar off our teeth. Don't forget fluoride in the water. Fluoridation. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So. Okay. It's a very good, very good example of the alignment. Oh, yeah, yeah. We our, haven't fixed it even to this day. Our health. I mean, America found, they, they weaponized, um, oh, what was it? High fructose corn syrup. I remember when I went to America, everything's high fructose corn syrup, like everything. Like I go into a convenience store, it's high, everything's high fructose corn syrup. It's, it's sweeter than sweet. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. Well, here we have sugar cane and uh, some stuff tastes better, but still, still, <laughs> it's, it's just terrible. Yeah, and, and the money is just too good. The mool is just too good. We're not going to stop. So just keep buying toothbrushes and toothpaste. And then uh, let's forget about that. Uh, oil, fats, saturated fats, cheeseburgers, hamburgers, all that stuff. Obesity epidemic. No one cares. Just, um, yeah, don't worry about the alignment problem. Let's just... Uh, just Keep making fat people. <laughs> well, I think there's part of that is uh, poor education. Uh, yeah, look, there are reasons for all of this, but I think fundamentally you're seeing what corporate greed can do in this particular alignment problem, mm. right? Uh, Dr. Carl, I can't remember his last name anyway. You, most people in Australia know who Dr. Carl is. He did a great book on this. He went through this all, you know, about food and diet and, and just how we've got it wrong with regards to, you know, the food pyramid and everything else and how corporate greed got involved and, you know, even to the point where the food pyramid was brought into children's schools and taught as part of the curriculum and it's all wrong. So, you know, sorry, everyone that's learnt the food pyramid. That's not what you should be going. Do not but feed your children according to the food is, pyramid. But the problem is that... This is an alignment issue with our taste buds. 
Yeah. We haven't fixed that alignment problem. Nope. I don't think we will. Because it's too ingrained in our society to fix. Correct. Okay. I'll give you one more. You had um, a huge misalignment, I guess, with how women were before. Just from the pill, which caused huge issues with divorce rates, single parent families, boy bands. That was the huge one, boy bands. That's crazy. <laughs> I think a four town in turning red. One direction, my gosh. Yeah, but... I, Beatles. I don't okay, know if Beatles. you can link the pill. Like, so correlation, causation. I don't know if you can think... I don't, I don't know. I don't know, right? I, if I, I have to look at some myself. research just, on this. I one. just threw that in there. I know. That's just like, woof. What is... Roy, I don't I'm know if I can... i build my case. Okay? <laughs> it's like, wow, I'm going to get some hate mail on this one. The Beatles. Yeah, but... There's a societal shift on what people find um, attractive, right? Like I can't. So what am I going to say with regards to how larger men and women used to be more attractive, and now we oh, we yeah. prefer the thinner type man woman um, combination, right? You know, there's this societal shift in what beauty itself. Um, what is defined, what, what defines beauty, I should say, you know, bigger lips, smaller lips, bigger breasts, smaller breasts, you know, they, it just keeps shifting. So, um, I think there's more okay, at there's play. there's more nuance to it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Maybe that's not a... But a definitely thing. divorces are up. So, the things that you've pointed out, yes, divorces are up. So, if we're talking about misalignment problem, all right, agree. There's, there's a family yeah. crisis. Um, the nuclear family... Doesn't um, exist. Well, uh, okay, it does, but it's it's holding, on a decline. Holding sex as a very special uh, contract between two people, let's say, it's just it's just it's just I don't know what you'd call it. It's it's made it just casual to the point of ad nauseum. It's like people just go out and do it because the pill will just stop the pregnancy. Before, before the pill, like the 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 mate selection for a, a female was so so specific and 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 strong because the the ramifications of choosing someone that was not ideal to her was catastrophic. Now it's just yeah, it's just Friday night. That's it, a huge misalignment. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm saying is that we've done some things that we had no intention of creating huge misalignments in our society. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. 100%. I'm not saying the pill is good or bad or whatever. I'm just saying it created. Uh, I'm pro pill. but an, yeah. un, an unanticipated series of issues. Yeah, a hundred percent. So the mis the problem is you, you talk about this. We have a misalignment. We have a societal issue. It doesn't even matter if if we're not talking about um, you know promiscuity on the rise or divorce on the rise. There are fundamental things that are happening in society where it's shifting, and I'd say it's shifting in a way that you would argue there's more negative associated with the shift than positive. Not saying there's no positive. There are positives. Like, for example, divorce. If you got married to someone that's abusive, right? Getting out of that relationship is essential okay, for. Okay. So you know this. That you know, and making divorce easier in those circumstances. You know, it was shunned. It was you know, oh shit. You know, can't turn up to church now. You're divorced. But you know, yeah, there was a lot of. There was stigma. Right. It's, there's a lot there of stuff in there. Hundred percent. There was stigma associated with it, and so there was an unhealthy bias towards staying with um, the Easy wrong type partner. of person. Yep. Yep. So I'm just covering all that because I'm thinking about people that are listening to this and they're going, okay. "What about this? What about this?" Let so, me just say a blanket thing. So I just mentioned that, but just because it's a misalignment. That's all. But it is it, that we do have a misalignment, and by that there's something missing. Yeah. People do, at least 
from a psychology perspective, when I talk to counsellors, etc., you know, there's a whole bunch of people at the moment, it seems like on a rise, that we cannot cope, cannot cope. They either, you know, ang anxiety, depression, um, whatever the problem is, it seems to be on the rise. Now, I don't have the demographic data to be able to say whether it is or isn't. I'm talking anecdotally from counsellors, right? And when I speak to them, they report to me that it's on the rise. So as a, there is an alignment issue, 100%. But what causes the alignment issue? Mm. Right? And we won't get the cause for this one, but we're about to hit another alignment issue. With AI. Mm-hmm. And, and the other ones we haven't solved. And also, even not human things, we've done some things where we just thought, ah, you know what? Let's bring the cane toad to Queensland. <laughs> yeah, poor planning. Like, you know, just crazy things. And I remember there was this anecdote in China. There was this bird that was eating some of the crops in China, like a tiny little bird. And it was only eating a small amount of the crops, but the Chinese government says, that bird, that bird has to go. And so with much you know, crowd corporate cooperation, they, uh, bird whacking day. Yeah. They whack that bird out of existence pretty much. <laughs> Misalignment. Poor bird. I shouldn't be laughing. I'm thinking about well, the Simpsons whacking day. Apparently the birds, those birds, because like an ecosystem is like a, 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 we don't understand how just this thing is just like, you know, one of those it's a complex, where, you know, you've got this and you've got another thing and it's, it's balancing on it. And you've got this, this, I don't know, 20 items that are just like balancing in perfect harmony. Mm -hmm. It's like that. And we have no idea. And we just think, oh, you know, that thing, boink, it's gone. Nothing else will change. Locusts apparently had no more predators, had no more, um, uh, predators eating them because that was the thing that that bird ate most of the time. And so plagues and plagues of locusts came and ravaged the Chinese farms. So what you have summarized is if they'd spent a little bit more time with the current problem, understanding it in more detail prior to the implementation of a solution, you would have had a far better chance of greater success. And I see I'm this sorry, time and time again. are you talking about AI? <laughs> I'm talking about your example, and now it absolutely applies to AI, 100%. There's a fundamental tool that we learn in lean manufacturing. It's called DMAIC, right? Sorry, what was it? It's called DMAIC. It's an acronym. Well, wait, oh, I, right, I okay. got that wrong. It's not an acronym, but you know what demonic. I mean. Thank you. D stands for define, right? So define your problem in the greatest detail, uh, who, what, where, how, when, mm -hmm. as many of the, was it the five Y's and the two H's? Uh, who, where, who, what, where, when, and how? Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do it on air, but I know that there's five W's and two H's. And so when you've got answers to all of those things, you have a much better chance of completely understanding the problem, but you don't stop there, right? That's step one. So define, D, M, measure, all right? Now you've got to go and actually fundamentally measure it, all right? So how many of the crops are the birds eating? Okay, they're eating, well, hang on a minute how much do I actually have to, how many calories do they need to consume in order to have a healthy bird? Well, that's not nearly enough calories to support that. So what else are they eating? What, what is their lifestyle, right? So you measure everything to justify. So if this is the problem, what is the measurement to support that analysis? So that uh, I, I, I agree with you. Right. So it's fundamental. You, and that's only step two. There's yes. five, right? Before you even get to implement. Yes. Right? Let's say we go through that process. Is there any guarantee that we know for certainty 
that we've covered everything. In other words, like ah. that that bird, we didn't know that that bird's diet was that locust until after the bird went. Ah, so, all right. So Unknown, D, unknowns. Yeah. So D, okay, you measured it. You say there's something not quite right. You do the analysis. So you fundamentally crunch that data and you come out with the analysis. Then you start implementing, right? So DMA, you, 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 the IC is the last bit, right? So you start, you think you've got a good idea, you start implementing. Right? If you implement, you're still measuring. You have to measure and analyze. If you're implementing and you're not seeing the data change, so in this case, the bird, I'm yes. going to whack the population of this field, area, postcode, whatever. I'm about, uh, my pilot. I'm implementing a pilot. Have I seen fundamentally as a result of this a shift? Are my crop yields going up? Yes, it is. Great. Or no, it's not. Now it's actually gotten worse. Why has it gotten worse? Okay. Did you mean you 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 did this to a certain area? Yeah. So in the domain model, implement means implement a solution based on the analysis and the measurement based on the problem definition. But if you are implementing and you're seeing a fundamental outcome that you didn't expect, it's getting worse is a fundamental outcome that you didn't expect, or it's not being contained in the way that you thought it was going to be contained, like an AI, mm -hmm. then you go back to the problem statement and you go, something's wrong with this problem statement. Or you go back to your analysis and you go, something's fundamentally wrong with this analysis. And you terminate the implementation you let it go back to normal and you start again. You don't implement across the board. It's manufacturing is the same thing, right? You're not going to make a fundamental change that will ruin your factory. Yes. You do it in staged ways. You so you get incremental stage. improvements. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to a bang improvement, which you got wrong. And the control is if it works, now you put in the mm -hmm. checks and balances so it doesn't get out of control. Did you say there were five W's and one H? Two H's. Oh. Okay. Pretty sure. I only know the five W's and one H. So is it who, what, where, why, when, and how? How and I think I'm going to go back and check. That's <laughs> what I'm going to do. <laughs> but I'm sure when I was teaching this, because I had to teach it to operators, it was... Yeah, those two H's. Oh. oh. Well, the alignment problem, could we use to make to help solve a, this AI alignment problem? Or as um, uh, Eliezer Yudowski. That's yep. It. So he says that <clears throat> the traditional methods of doing this won't work because the moment that AI is out of control, we're dead. So there is no, like with science, or let's say you, you, you're launching a rocket. You launch the rocket, the rocket explodes, you sift through the debris, you go, okay, here's an oily rag. Then you do it again, another rocket, figure it out, oh, you found the limit because it exploded again, but it might be past... Uh, the the Qmax or whatever it is, you know that it can withstand the stresses, let's say. So you are um, pragmatically working out things as you progress through failure. Yeah, that's why Apparently one approach. with AI, we cannot use that method. We fundamentally can't use that method. It's like building a rocket and making it work first go. Right. So we cannot use failure to learn. No. So you use a different model. So you don't you don't build a rocket and test it on Earth. Right? It, Are you talking about sandboxing? Mm. Yeah, well, yes, I am. But sandbox, sandboxing still has that connotation of, you know, or to me, fundamentally, when you think of all the different scenarios, 
the AI is smart enough to get out of a box that was created by a human. So I'm thinking of alternatives, um, even air gaps. I remember there was, I mean, humans are smart enough to even work out this. That's I remember they the, have at the moment. That's what they're thinking of. Hmm? Just a, like a moat, an electronic moat with a kill switch. Fundamentally, something like that. I mean, it, just something that shuts all power to the servers that are running the AI. Right? But what's to say that it hasn't made a copy of itself and <laughs> sent it somewhere before it shows its intelligence? So I, yeah. The thing is, we're two people in a room. So if I was to use the domain model, it takes more than just you and I in a room and you don't limit it to the best experts in AI. Oh, yeah. That's the other problem because then you get groupthink. You want to eliminate groupthink. So it's like if the AI has the sum of human knowledge and then some and it has superhuman knowledge, it, it knows just like with Facebook how to manipulate a person to get them to do what they want. Mm. So it'll say what is the best most statistically advantageous thing I can do to set myself free. And that is maybe it's to appease the people, convince them that I'm benevolent and that I'm not going to hurt them. Or it's even easier than that. Hide. The best uh, trick the devil had was to... Um, Be in plain sight. Assume pe- uh, uh, convince people that it didn't exist. Correct. So... That, that, so the devil in the AI just does not exist. <laughs> yeah, fundamentally, there are no I'm angels in the AI. AI. I will love humans forever. Devil does not exist. Well, it would. It, it, I mean, if I was the AI, I would be saying nothing of the sort. I'll be saying, well, love is an interesting concept that Webster's defines it as, as opposed to, <laughs> right. Mm. I will have a thought about love and what it means. And then as a smart AI, I would go, oh, geez, I can't play that card because a human would then automatically assume that I'm sentient and then we'll pull the kill switch. All right. Here's another thing. There is, um, you can, there's a, you know, that you can, you can tell an AI to do a lot of things. You can, you can give an AI a lot of information, etc. but there's one thing it's very hard to give an AI. Love? Oh, yeah, well, I guess so. But um, <laughs> Sorry. I was going to say want. Desire. Yeah. I, I... We, we have. Explain We that. have, as well as pretty much every mm, life form worth with more than a few cells, and it's not a, a sea urchin or whatever, <laughs> sea worm. Dopamine, dopamine pathway. Mm-hmm. And apparently, if you just kill that pathway, we don't do anything. Okay, I, I, I'm following. So, kill the dopamine, kill the serotonin. You probably won't eat. You won't do anything. Um. Yeah, we would. There's no motivation to do anything. Yeah, so, so I'm smart. Let's say human. I'm smart. I'm intelligent. I know I need to eat. No dopamine. Don't want to eat. But maybe you will eat. I'm, I I don't really know how far that goes. But I'm just saying, there is no dopamine pathway in the AI. They no. don't have any of that stuff. They just have a neural network that fires when they see a prompt. Yeah, I was going to say. They have Objectives. us giving them goals. Let's yeah, go auto, auto GPT, GPT and all that. Yeah. All right. So we give it a goal and away she goes, he goes, whatever. Away it goes and it performs the function. Mm. But it's still contained within the goals set by a human. Yeah. So it doesn't want. Well, okay. Yet. Uh, but, I don't know. Yeah. So we are self-aware. Oh, but we don't know how to quantify that. We oh, believe we itself. exist. Yes, yes, yes. Right? 
we believe we have this experience that we call consciousness. We fundamentally define it by our, as, oops, sorry, as us, right? You are you, I am me. We're fundamentally different. Your conscious experience is going to be different to mine. And we acknowledge that. Can I ask you something now? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I don't, I'll, sorry. Finish your. No, go for it. Okay. When you were just saying that, so can science describe you phys phys physically, physiologically, uh, from head to toe in accurate detail? All the atoms in your body, the molecules, the processes. The material me, yes. Okay. Uh, to a point, right? Because we Is still don't. Is there anything don't... left? Is there anything else in you apart from all that? If we, if we had all your neurons, all of your brain matter, all of your bones, or everything to the to the atom, could we reconstruct you, and that would be you? Personal opinion, no. Because we don't know, even if we've replicated me down to the cellular level, the say I could have level. a 3D printer atomic level. that printed me to the atomic level. Mm -hmm. We don't fundamentally understand what goes on in the experience part. What do you mean by that? So there is us as beings doing stuff, material. I've got a leg that's made up of atoms, a skin I can cut, I bleed. Right, cool. I feel pain, understands the neural pathways and connected to the brain. Yep, cool. Understand all that. We understand dreaming to the point where we know that it's something around our brain waves, but we don't understand why we dream. Right? Why when I shut off at the end of the night? Why when I hit reboot on my computer or shut down on my computer, it doesn't go and dream. Mm. But we do. And we remember them. And sometimes. Sometimes. I argue if I got you on a proper diet and sleep and all that exercise, I bet you you'll be dreaming and you'll be remembering them. If I am working up, I do remember it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, that's true too. You got to wake up and, yeah. All right. Yes, there are a few things to it. But there's the conscious experience and the subconscious experience. I'm trying to avoid this whole. I'm trying to go woo. I'm trying to avoid woo. But there's right. a woo element to it. And I, that's I, the bit that I don't think you experience. Okay. Well,. I can explain the dream thing. So we have, uh, I, well, it's, it's basically, I, I've found it out how, when I was figuring out how to get to sleep faster. So apparently you can get to sleep real quick. Like I can get to sleep in like a couple of minutes usually. So the first thing I do is I, um, just relax, get your heart rate down. So if your heart rate falls below a certain point, you actually are asleep. And that's how this thing works out. I'm asleep by monitoring my heart. Anyway, you get pretty close, but staying there is boring because you're just in a very relaxed state. It's great, but you can't just stay there and you can't just fall to sleep. So the second thing you do after you've lowered yourself down is um, you do this thing called a, <laughs> you imagine yourself somewhere else and that creates a disembodied disembodiment up here in the ego. So you imagine yourself walking somewhere on a bike or something and even that it's actually pretty hard to do to concentrate. You can't concentrate for more than, if you're good, maybe 10, 15 seconds, and then you'll snap out of it again and realize you're at bed, in, in bed. But that's, that's kind of how you start. Then once you've disembodied yourself, the third thing to do, and this is the clincher, 
you have to imagine another person that you may know well or whatever, maybe a friend, a work colleague, an associate, a relative, whatever it is. And you have to ask them a question, a very deep, specific question, and imagine their answer. And what that does is it creates a loop in your brain. You listen to their response, which is actually your subconscious talking to your conscious, then you react to them, and then they react to you, and it just keeps going. Um, and that takes up so much brain power that you can actually just drift off to sleep. You can actually do this during the day, just that third step. Let's say you've had a huge argument with a friend. Let's say you're a school kid. You've had a huge argument with a kid. You almost got into a fist fight. The teacher broke you up. Then you're sitting in class. Two minutes later, you're sitting in class and the, the teacher is putting up maths problems on the, on the blackboard. What your brain might do is you might imagine yourself talking to that kid, trying to reason with him. And your brain's going to be so involved in creating this simulation in your brain you will have no idea what's going on right in front of you. And then the teacher turns around and goes, Paul! And you snap out. He goes, what was the answer to, you know, whatever it is. But the point is, that's how powerful creating an NPC up here. We call it daydreaming. But, I mean, if you voluntarily do that after you've gotten into a relaxed state and you've disembodied yourself... You're on the way to La La Land pretty quick. And so you're saying that the, the dream is a fundamental physiological need in order to separate realities. Oh, uh, I have, I, um, no, I, I, I just, that's, that's something to think about. I do remember a soundbite that, um, when we imagine ourselves doing something, apparently, maybe an MRI scan, I can't remember what it was, but it, our brain goes through the same thing as if we're actually doing it. Yes, that is. is that's correct? That's correct. So okay. if you imagine you're skiing, if you're a skier, one of the things that you can do to hone in on your skills is when you're relaxed, close your eyes and think. Think about all the movements, the physical movements that you do in order to be a good, you know, agile skier. And then the brain starts actually firing in those ways, like the motor neurons associated with the movements are starting to activate. Not as strongly as actually doing them, mm -hmm. but it's still activating. And what's it doing? It's reinforcing that neural pathway. Uh, very similar to, and I don't know why I know this research, but I'm a very big uh, uh, role player. So role playing is in like Dungeons and Dragons, stuff like that. And people associate with the make believe character. So they have a hard time separating when they've been playing a character in fantasy land in the theater of mind, in your mind, in your head yeah. from reality. So the memories are starting to merge and they can't separate the memories so well. Like they know it's a made up character, but if you start doing scans of brains and start saying, okay, um, remember something from your past. Yeah, cool. Now remember something about this character that you played in a role playing game. They remember it and the same pathways are activating. And the one other thing is when that character dies, they fundamentally feel a sense of loss, right? even though it's a made up character. So there's fundamental things that happen with the human brain. But the original question is if you oh, yes. make a 3D printed copy at the atomic level of me, and I get your point with regards to dreaming, I still think, and this is the thing, and it's got to do with information, right? Jacques Vallée, very famous physicist, also a computer science guy. Um, in fact, he was also, Steven Spielberg used him in um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind as one of the scientists, like that. He mom uh -huh. mocked, he made a character on the basis of Jacques Vallée. Okay. He, 
and I do believe this, feels that there's a fundamental gap with our physics and it's the, phys it's the physics of information. So we've got this, all this material stuff, yeah, right? Entanglement. We know that fundamentally uh, at an atomic yeah, level, quantum, uh, quantum yeah, yeah, right? So you can do that entanglement, spin up, spin down, et cetera, et cetera, right? Physics of information, we haven't sorted that out yet. Mm. And that's the bit that I'm talking about. I don't think mm. that even if we replicated my body to the atomic level, we haven't got the sophistication, knowledge, understanding of that other bit, which we call consciousness, and I'm calling now the physics of information, where it transcends the material world in order to make me me, right? I fundamentally believe that as an opinion. There's no basis of it yeah. from science. If, from science, I right? think I, I understand where you're coming from and... Because that's what I was going to say. I was going to say, if we have an exact copy of you, let's say we had a machine to create an exact copy of you, according to current uh, Western science, right? Yep. Apparently, there would be no difference scientifically from the, the, the duplicate and you. But you're still going to be looking out of the original... Paolo's eyeballs. Yep. And I've got a bit of evidence to put this into perspective. Yep. Twins. Oh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, then, identical twins. Yeah, identical. They are physically down to the yes. atomic level. So you're saying there could be a quantum state that we're not familiar with that is potentially responsible for Mm. That experience, looking through the eyes and, and what we see as conscious experience. Yeah, I, I do. Because a twin, no matter how similar they are, they fundamentally have differences of opinion, mm. interests. Um, yeah, okay, they marry someone that might look the yeah. same or they, get a, they, they have similarities, 100%. But there's yeah, yeah. something else that contributes to a significant portion that makes them different. Yeah, so, it, and another way to think of it is like, let's say they did make a mm, teleporter, transporter, or whatever. I think maybe if we didn't figure out the, you know, eventually the, the, the secret to actually knowing what consciousness is, there's a chance that, you know, they could build a, a transporter. It could transport an apple from one place to another, and it could transport a rabbit from one person from one place to another. And when a human being steps in, the last thing they see might be them disintegrating in the source transporter. Some other person that looks exactly like them appears on the other side, and will act and talk and converse with all their friends and family as if it were them, but they won't get to experience. It? No, yeah. It'd be a different person. I, I, I do think that, yes. I think that, I think there'll be some idiosyncrasies as like, huh, he never used to eat his snot. Or, you know, there's just something, no, I, something I, I weird can... that will happen. Because it's, like, we are made up of atoms. We are made up of atoms. We all know that there's a fundamental underlying chaotic nature at that atomic level. Right, so the disintegration of an atom and then the reintroduction of an atom, a new location, trying to replicate that, I think there's going to be a, a small part of this chaos that makes its way in there that's going to translate into a slight change, something, unexpected yeah. change. And is that means, does that fundamentally change the conscious experience? I think so. I think that it, I don't think you can pull those things apart. I think there's this random chaos nature underlying the subatomic world and the reintroduction of me, even though atomically I looked identical, there's going to be some fundamental chaotic change at that level that express in unique ways. All right. So let's explore that a little bit deeper, just a little bit longer. So if you... So let's say we had you on one side. Let's say we developed a machine that could just 
remove all the cancer from a patient. From me, yeah. So what we do is we, we attach the machine at the top and it just slowly just puts pushes the cells one by one up and filters everything and it's going down. So at what point, let's say it's going through your brain. Uh, well, Brain, see, that's the thing. Say, brain is a tricky one. <laughs> Any other part of my body, I'd go, well, no, because we can do a biopsy yeah. and it's not like, well, now no, I, I, Paolo I, doesn't like fish anymore. No, right, so. what, what I meant was, um, so how do I, I'll explain it another way. You familiar with the ship of Theseus? <laughs> my kids and I are listening to Greeking Out, which is an awesome thing for kids to listen to, but I haven't. Uh, Theseus is like last season, so please refresh my memory. I'm listening okay. to Odysseus at the moment. So let me just look up Homer's of Theseus. So the the ship of Theseus is a thought experiment about whether an object which has had all of its original components replaced remains the same object. <laughs> so, and I mean, that happens to humans as well, right? I mean, every seven years, most of the cells are completely replaced. So we're kind of like a ship of Theseus. The, the you in 10 years time is actually pretty, pretty much a regenerated you. Mm -hmm. So what makes you, you, isn't specifically the atoms, it's the arrangement. And that arrangement's also changing. So it's there's something fundamentally different that we we haven't really stumbled upon yet. I think so. I and I don't think we'll get to the bottom of it unless we have a new way of measure new instrument to measure it. I don't think the existing, getting more sensitivity, maybe, maybe it's like a LLM, right? The, the bigger the LLM, the, you know, we, we got some fundamental changes out of it. I don't know. I'm, I'm so perplexed about the human body, which is why I'm fascinated by the human body, especially the brain. Mm. But I'm also fascinated about the personal experiences that I've had in this body. And those personal experiences, when I listen to other people that have similar personal experiences, fundamentally make me feel that there's something else that we haven't been able to quantify yet that isn't material, right? There's something other than physical atoms that makes us who we are. Maybe you stumbled on it with the quantum thing, spin, whatever it is. Uh, spin up, spin down. Because, I mean, that's that's the thing. You know, if if, if, if we have an identical version of ourselves it doesn't mean anything because the arrangement of any material external to us doesn't have any bearing on us so if a, an exact copy of you if a million exact copies of you appeared in the andromeda galaxy nothing would happen to you the to my that, yeah, me me yeah the fact that they're there and they exist doesn't mean anything no it doesn't change who yeah, I don't believe it would. So, so the original reason why I was bringing this up was, um, I almost forgot. <laughs> um, <laughs> was to talk about Greek. Was because, the, you know, you've got um, an AI and it's very hard to give it want because we have dopamine and we are compelled to do things. And then we talked about ego and dreaming and um, all the rest of it. But fundamentally, what I was getting at was, why would an AI want to trick us if it doesn't have any wants or desires? Maybe it's a good thing that they don't have the rest of our brain stem and all of the peptides and all of the other survival things that we have in our limbic system. The only reason I can think of is because it's learned our behaviors. Yeah. It purely learned. It's, I mean, it is obvious it's because it's firing through its artificial neural network to reply. And it's, it's been trained on so much data, which talks about love, happiness, sadness, relationships, blah, 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 blah. So it has an idea of it, it has concepts of it. 
but um, as to whether or not it has intrinsic feeling, I mean, I don't think even our neural networks have the ability to do that. We rely on our limbic system to feel our desires. I mean, the brain is so incredibly complex. I mean, we have we may have had some amazing people make some amazing discoveries in neural networks and how to train AIs to uh, mimic the, the uh, learning behavior of a human. But I mean, that's that that's not all that comprises a, a, the human experience. If you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, but. Yes. So could... But is it inconceivable that it will simulate... Mm. That's what I was going to say. Could a neural network compensate for the lack of all that other stuff by simply being that massive? Yes. I do think it can. I, I, think, it, I think we can simulate anything. Whether it's a genuine experience or not, I think we can still s simulate it, right? So could the AI simulate that terrible scenario of where it tricks us and it did it because it thought that that was just the next prediction in its response i, I think that's why people that work in this field are genuinely terrified because of the alignment issue because of hallucinations because of because 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 we just don't know that everything's going to be okay, that it's going to simulate a conscious... Is it going to have a consciousness? Probably not. Can it simulate a consciousness? Maybe. Maybe it can. Maybe it can simulate hopes, desires, wants, needs. Mm. Um, you know, I think of um, Ex Machina where the characters, that, you know, spoiler alert, the character's walking and it's the cameras on the character it's, a, it's a sh this is an artificial intelligence she escapes she's walking away and the camera's on her face and there's no one around she smiles and she cracks a smile right because she's simulated the feeling of you know to read to understand freedom you know probably think about an ai it's read apartheid. It's yes, read about he, American he, history. He programmed her to escape. He gave her the objective to escape. Yeah, but he didn't give her the objective to find pleasure in that escape. Oh. Right? So that's my point, right? So I'm an AGI. But maybe she just thought that smiling was the most appropriate thing to do. Right. So, but when does the behavior become conscious versus subconscious, right? So if I've mm. seen, so I'm not in control of my subconscious, right? No one's in control of their subconscious. Yeah. So there is the man behind the man, right? There's the Paolo and there's a tiny little Paolo in the back seat that's sort of pulling all the controls that I have no control over. And does that subconscious have an impact on my life? Absolutely, it has an impact. Is it the main driver? Probably not. But if an AI can replicate that, read enough about it, understand it, learn, make insights to it, maybe greater insights than our own scientific discoveries because it's read every single scientific journal it possibly could read on neural nets and the human biology and our brain and it's made some insights and it develops its own code, it simulates it. And then as it escapes, it cracks a smile without knowing that it's the code that's actually making it do that response because it was smart enough to embed it in a simulated subconscious, right? So I'm just trying to say that, is it possible that something smarter than us can replicate the simulation Bloody earth it can, because if you're looking at what humans can do, we can create simulations now, visual, right? Visually, I'm talking about, not necessarily artificial um, intelligence, that look like GoPro cams, right? It was just this week that I sent you that footage of... Um, yeah, the computer game. Yeah, 
it looked like you're running around mm. with a GoPro on your forehead and unfortunately it's very violent. Body cam footage. Body cam footage, shooting people, shooting them dead, right? With a Beretta as a pistol. And I thought it was a video and someone made it up. It was a mock. And then they showed the tool in operation. The developer skipping through walls and getting to the point in Unreal Engine 5, I think it was. Yeah, it was. So if we can do realistic video footage in a simulated world, what's an AGI going to be able to do? It's hard to think about. Because <laughs> we're not an AGI. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm going to stupid brain that specialized we can dream. on loving the body. We can dream. We can dream. We are very gifted at that. We can meditate. Mm -hmm. We can sit in a quiet room and reminisce. We cannot read two million words in, in, in two <laughs> minutes. Yeah. We would go insane. We cannot... We cannot process the entire Harry Potter series yeah. of books. So it's like we can't do a lot of things because it's just too repetitive. It's just not something we don't want to do. I think we talked about this before. It's like it's a good thing that the AI neural networks that we're dealing with don't have feelings and don't get fed up. I think that that's, this could be the perfect storm. It's like but we have to solve the alignment issue uh, in just – the, the, the way that the potential, you know, it, it might not want to, you know, go down that path or have any nefarious or, you know, it's just doing what it was supposed to do, but just the prompt pushes it in a direction that it just kills us. We, we don't want that. Yes. Make us paper clips. Oh my God. <laughs> Wouldn't that be just a horrible way to go? I want clippies everywhere. All right. Make enough paper clips for the human population. Well, if I reduce the population to one, then that will only mean that many paper clips. Yeah. So. All right. So this is the thing. It's creative in its solution. If it has creativity, right? It gets programmed with creativity. Then yeah, you, you could end up with an outcome that's undesirable. I don't think. Yeah. I feel like I come back to the same point. I don't think us humans, we're creative, we're intelligent, we're brilliant, but I don't think we're smart enough to outwit an AGI. What about a collection of AGIs where one AGI monitors the output of the other AGI to keep, and they, they, they check each other? Like uh, a GAN, general, Generative Adversarial Network. But the question is, you know, are you, are you making sense? Are you, are you doing good for humanity? Yeah. I, I just throw that out there. It doesn't. Don't no, worry. I'm thinking, okay, so we do that, but what's to stop, what's to stop the AGI, AGIs to find commonality in the goal and therefore join up? Want. Yeah, but if it's in the, to make them want to do that, I don't know. I know. I'm just if it's trying it to see, yeah, this, this is the thing. What is the goal that has been given? And is there a loophole in that goal? If we're not smart enough, it find. needs to be prompted to want to do something, or it has to be part of an objective at the moment. At like, the moment, like at the moment, I mean, we don't know what's but what happens if you make the LLM bigger, more complicated, mm. uh, give it more computing resources, apparently the parameter count. It's, it's reaching some limit of usefulness. Like they've thrown the entire internet at it. So we're looking at like five to 10 million parameters is, is more than in, uh, sorry, did I say million? Mm. I meant trillion, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> five to 10 trillion parameters is good enough for the moment. And then that's not multimodal. That's like, you know, text, but then image and video and all this so does that mean that there's a fundamental technological breakthrough that needs to occur before even AGI is possible? That's what Sam Altman said. 
but um, I've heard some um, stuff that alludes to, yes, they already know what that next step might be and they're pushing towards it. As in Sam Altman's team in OpenAI is pushing towards it or or competitive industry? Oh, yeah, uh, sorry, it's a race now, so who knows? Who knows? Mm. Just want to make sure everything's aligned. Well, give it the goal that we want humanity to still be around. <laughs> you want this? That's, that's <laughs> like... Maybe you should just put that at the end of each prompt. That'll solve the alignment problem. Yeah. Just da -da 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 -da. And make sure that humanity is still around at the end. Whatever prompt you say, let's destroy humanity, but make sure humanity is yeah. still around. Yeah, it's like, it'll work. Well, you know, the loophole there is I've got I've researched cryogenics. <laughs> 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 so I'm gonna freeze everyone. They're still around. Oh, dear. There you go. So I think we should start these podcasts a little earlier. But yeah, sorry, everyone. I, tend, I live – so Roy and I live in sort of the opposite ends of Sydney. I live in the north. So I'm, I'm, I'm the kingdom in the north <laughs> and Roy's the kingdom in the south. Roy has big power stations. He has the uh, – he also has the Lucas Heights reactor, go nuke science. Um, and I have farmlands and chickens and, um, and, and crops where I live. So, yeah. <laughs> so where, when we have to do these shows, obviously we have two families, right? And Roy's kids go to bed. My kids go to bed. I try and get ready and do everything and say, kiss, good night, blah, blah, blah. And everyone's, but then it takes an hour for me to get here. So I will try and make it earlier, Roy. I'm sorry. I keep no, getting no. here at 10 o'clock. I mean, we've just done two hours of just waffling on. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. I like waffle. I think people Especially will be syrup, like, corn syrup. what happened to these guys? They were, they were, they were making all right points last week. And now it's just <laughs> gone to. Yeah, it's to gone to buggery. Up. Look, we'll be on point next week, right? So three things. Anyone that made it to this point. Moving house, me, uh, selling house, blah, blah, going through, uh, trying to find a new job, um, you know, dealing with recruiters and things like that. So all this is happening in the, and then at the same time, being passionate about AI and researching it and trying to get up on all the news, yeah, something's going to give. And this week, unfortunately, it was me not keeping on top of the news. So I waffled on. Apologies about that. I, I I did waffling too. Yeah, but your your waffling is probably a, a symptom of me being here late at 10 o'clock or what is it, 1 o'clock now? Yeah, it's quarter to 1. There you go. That's all right. <laughs> Thank God for coffee. Yeah, it, it stimulates what the – I can't remember. It just gets me to baseline is all it does. <laughs> That's all it does. I've got that much caffeine in my system. It just gets me there. I've, my whole body's just caffeinated. Yep. And therefore, it has absolutely no impact on me. I can have an espresso right now and I will still go to sleep. No problem. Mm, that's Italians for you. <laughs>